Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in for our afternoon sermon broadcast. This is Southeast City Church, and my name is David Hood, and I help give pastoral leadership to Southeast City Church, and I am so thrilled uh, to have you tuning in today as we go through Hebrews chapter 11, uh, what is oftentimes called the Hall of Faith or the Faith uh, Hall of Fame. There's a lot in this chapter, a lot for us to learn and be uh, challenged, encouraged, and inspired by. So thank you again so much for being here. Uh, if you weren't here last week, just a couple of things quickly. Uh, for the month of August, to give our volunteer teams a bit of a break, um, what will be uploaded to Facebook to premiere at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoons will just be recordings of my sermon, so we won't be doing recordings or live streams of a whole service right now, but just the sermon. We are hoping, though, uh, in September, uh, come September uh, 12th, to be back inside at our building uh, exclusively and hopefully permanently, uh, and we will be live streaming uh, when we return to being indoors exclusively. For our in-person services, we're gathering outside uh, right now. We will go inside if the weather is poor, but we're trying to be outside as much as possible uh, for what we're calling church in the garden. So you are more than welcome to join us in person. You don't have to register anymore ahead of time, which is really nice because even though we did that for months and months and months, it feels like people still uh, almost every week uh, forgot to register and had to be reminded or showed up and had to register on the spot. So you don't have to do that anymore because we can have as many people as can safely distance uh, from each other, both outside and inside. So we don't have the same percentage caps and number caps. So no registration. Feel free to just show up. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would read uh, our Worship Safe protocols, which are found at our website. We'd appreciate it if you read those in full before coming. You need to sign off uh, that you've read them in full. So if you haven't, you'll have, to re you'll have to read them when you come. It's easier to read them, obviously, before uh, you come. So if you'd like to be with us in person, uh, Church in the Garden, 4 to 5 every Sunday, uh, if it's bad weather, we'll move inside. So there will be something four to five every Sunday. We meet at the Martin Luther Church, 933 Smythe Road. We'd love to see you. Church family, uh, I offered an encouragement last week, and I will offer that encouragement again. Uh, we really do feel, uh, after a, a long <laughs> year and a half of COVID and lockdowns and all of these different things, we really do feel that it is time to return. It's time to come home. And so if you have been watching exclusively online, I really would encourage you to prayerfully consider returning to in-person with us. Uh, the numbers are low in our city. The vaccin vaccination rate is high, and we are still operating uh, with all of the restrictions or almost all of the restrictions that were in place when numbers were high and vaccinations were low. So Vaccinations are high, numbers are low, and we still have the restrictions, so our gatherings are very, very safe. Uh, nothing bad has happened uh, as a result of a gathering yet, and so I really would encourage you to prayerfully uh, consider returning back to in-person with us. Online is fantastic. It's great. I'm glad that we have online. We will keep having online, uh, hopefully, for years to come, even when this whole pandemic thing is over. We have seen tremendous value in being online. All kinds of people are tuning in that wouldn't come in in person. Uh, we have several people with health conditions in our church who sometimes can't make it out in person, so being able to give them uh, the service uh, live over the internet has been uh, amazing. We want to be able to keep doing that for them because their condition is not tied to COVID. They have the condition all the time, and so there will be Sundays they can come and Sundays they can't. So we want to keep having this for them. So online is fantastic and great, and it was absolutely necessary for a time, and there's good in it, so we'll keep it going. But I think we can all agree that it's not the same. It's not the same as in person. It's not the same as embodied worship and community. And so if you are able, uh, I would want to encourage you to pray very sincerely uh, about returning to being in person with us and not solely relying uh, on these recordings and these live streams in the Sundays to come. We miss you. 
We long to see your face. And we long to hear your voice uh, as we worship together and to take communion as a body physically uh, together and to learn together. So, yeah, we hope to see you back if you haven't been back yet. Today we are in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, continuing our series uh, in Jesus is Greater. Uh, and I'm going to pray and we'll get into this text. Not the whole text, obviously. It's a lot of verses. Um, so we're going to be looking at select verses. Uh, I'll pray. Father, thank you again so much for the chance to be together like this. God, thank you indeed for technology that has allowed our church to keep preaching Jesus even when we had to close our buildings. So God, thank you so much for this amazing tool and thank you for this amazing passage today. And God, I pray that as I teach this passage, everything I say would be good and right and true and accurate. I pray that it would be a blessing and a help, an encouragement, a challenge, an inspiration for your people. The text is inspirational. So God, please use this text in whatever way is needed in our lives today. May we be people who live more and more and more by faith as a result of this uh, text read and this text taught today. So God, bless our time and uh, do in our lives what only you can do for your glory and our good. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith. <laughs> faith is a, a really complicated topic. What exactly is faith? And what does it mean to live by faith? We, we talk all the time as Christians. If you're not a Christian, Christians talk all the time uh, about living by faith. And what exactly does that mean? A lot of people have different opinions uh, on what faith is and different definitions of faith. What does scripture, what do the words of Jesus and his apostles, his followers have to say about faith? Well, thankfully, that question is answered, I think, quite well. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 today, the preacher starts Hebrews chapter 11 by giving this definition of faith. He says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For our ancestors won God's approval by it. Faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. What the preacher is saying here is that faith is believing that what we hope for is real. Faith is believing that what we hope for is real and that what we cannot see is real. That the unseen realm, the things that are unseen, are real even though our senses cannot perceive them. That's what faith is. Faith is believing that what we hope for is real and believing that what we can't see is real. Now in Christianity, our faith is not baseless or without ev any evidence. It isn't a giant leap into total, utter darkness. Uh, I like the way I heard it put once. God has given us enough that trusting in him is not completely without warrant, but he hasn't given us everything. He's given us enough that trusting him is not completely without warrant, but he hasn't given us everything. He has held back enough that there must still be trust. There must still be faith. So our faith is not baseless or without evidence, but we still need faith in the Christian life. What do I mean by that? Well, this might come as a bit of a surprise uh, from a Christian pastor, but you cannot absolutely prove that Christianity is true. You cannot absolutely prove that Christianity is true. There is loads of evidence for the truthfulness of Jesus and his claims as they're recorded in the scriptures. And there is certainly tons of proof or evidence for his bodily resurrection from the dead, which launched the church and turned the Roman Empire upside down. But there still needs to be faith. There still needs to be faith. There are a lot of things that I believe are true because of the things I'm convinced are true. There's a lot of things that I believe are true because of the things that I'm convinced are true. I'm convinced that Jesus resurrected bodily from the dead three days after his crucifixion, that he was stone cold dead and then he was bodily resurrected and alive. 
I believe that the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact that stands up under any scrutiny and indeed has stood up under all of the scrutiny that's been thrown at it. No one has ever offered a better explanation for the empty tomb and the sudden appearance and explosion of the Christian church, of the Christian faith on the earth, especially in the early days amongst Jews who believed in the absolute oneness of God and believed that God would never debase himself to become a man, that the Sabbath is Saturday and the penalty for not keeping it is death, that salvation is in the temple and the sacrifices. Jews abandoned these things to follow Jesus. No other explanation has been given that answers all of this other than the bodily resurrection of Jesus is true. And those who often deny the resurrection do so because of their a priori commitments. There can be no miracles. There can be no resurrection. Therefore, this cannot be true, even though there's lots of evidence that it is true and it did happen. Because I'm convinced of the resurrection, believe the resurrection, I believe what Jesus says, therefore, about himself. That he's the God-man, the Son of God in human flesh. I believe what he has to say about me. I believe what he has to say about the human condition. I believe what he has to say about eternity, about heaven and hell, about the spiritual realm, angels and the devil and demons. I, I believe what he has to say about the heart and character of God. I believe the Hebrew Bible because Jesus believed it even though I don't have an answer for every objection that gets raised against the Hebrew Bible. I, I believe the New Testament because Jesus told his apostles he would send his spirit to them who would give them recollection of everything that he did and everything that he taught and that he would send his spirit to them who would lead them into all truth so that they could, through their teachings and writings, lay the foundation of the church, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. A lot of my beliefs are rooted in the resurrection. My, my beliefs aren't baseless or without evidence. They aren't a giant leap into total darkness, but there still, as you've heard, has to be a lot of faith. There has to be faith. There always has to be faith. In, in the moment when we are saved, in the moment when we come to believe and entrust ourselves to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit can and does overwhelm us with the grandeur and beauty and reality and truthfulness and glory and necessity of it all, but there still needs to be that step of faith. We still need to entrust ourselves to Jesus, not really knowing everything knowing what we need to know, but not really knowing everything. As an aside, and I would take a bullet for Jesus, so I don't really believe that this is the case, but as an aside, even if it turned out that Christianity wasn't true, I would still choose the way of Jesus. Even if it turned out Christianity wasn't true, I would still choose the way of of Jesus. I, I think C.S. Lewis puts it best in the Narnia book, The Silver Chair. In The Silver Chair, a bit of background, Prince Rillian, who is Caspian's son, he's the heir to the throne of Narnia. He's kidnapped by the queen of the Underland, who has bewitched him uh, and a horde of gnomes in an effort to conquer Narnia, to take it back from Aslan. And Puddleglum and Jill and Eustace, they attempt to rescue the prince, but in their efforts to do so, they're put under a spell by the queen of the Underland, and she tries to convince them that Narnia and Aslan and the earth, they aren't real, and Puddleglum is the only one who is successfully able to counter the illusion. And this is what he says. He says to the queen, suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself, suppose we have, then all I can say is that in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. 
And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. I love that. All of my years of being a Christian, I have become convinced that Jesus is better than anything. We've been looking at how Jesus is greater in this whole series, and he's not just greater than the characters in the Old Testament. He's not just greater than the Old Covenant. Jesus is greater than anything atheism or humanism or secularism or Islam or Buddhism or social Darwinism or the American dream or existentialism or postmodernism or consumerism or progressivism has to offer. He's better than all of it. And so even if it turns out Christianity is not true, which I really, really, really don't believe is the case, but even if there's a slim chance that it turned out Christianity was not true, I would regret nothing. I wouldn't regret living for Jesus. I still think Jesus' way is better. And interestingly, the fact that Jesus' way continues to be better than everything that tries to replace it is to me evidence of the reality of Christianity, the reality of Jesus, that it stands the test of time and we can't come up with anything better. Jesus really is the answer to our questions, the solution to our problems, and the one who can satisfy our deepest yearnings and longings. So while there's a lot of evidence for Christianity, there still has to be faith. There's enough that it's not baseless, but there's enough held back that there always needs to be faith and trust. At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is just silly, (laughs) right? If you're not a Christian, You might be thinking, this is just silly. Religious people are silly for having faith. We need facts. We need hard data. But here's the thing. Everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. You can't actually get through this life without a measure of faith. One of the mantras we hear in our society right now is that science and reason alone can be trusted, and they will give us all of the answers. Well, this is actually a faith statement. There's faith behind this. It requires faith to believe that what our minds and our senses perceive of the world is actually reality. That what we perceive is actually reality. That our brains are not just hooked up to machines somewhere like in the matrix or that we aren't just perceiving what um, evolutionary adaptations have told us is, is beneficial for us we, we have to trust that our minds and our senses are actually perceiving what is real, and therefore science and reason can actually happen. That takes faith, especially if there isn't a God. The belief that all human beings are endowed with inalienable rights is also a faith statement. If there is no God, you can't get to human rights from Darwinian evolution, from a world of the survival of the fittest. You can't get to human rights from that. And yet we believe in human rights. There's faith behind that. So we all have to, at some point, live by faith. I would say that a lot of the things that people take by faith in our society that are not Christian, that those things take more faith than Christianity does. A question you might have as a Christian at this point is, why faith? (laughs) Why faith? Why can't God just show us everything? Why can't he just show us everything? Why does he hold some things back? And the only answer that I have for that, and this might not be satisfactory, but what can I do? The only answer I have for that is because God in his infinite wisdom has concluded that this is the best arrangement. That requiring, necessitating faith is the best way. God says in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration for as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
God in his infinite wisdom has determined that the arrangement we have is the one that brings him the most glory. It's the one that reveals the, the weightiness of his compassion and love and grace and mercy and justice. It is the one that gives him the most glory, and it is the one that leads us to the most thriving and flourishing. We might not understand it, but this is what God knows and says is best. So even there, <laughs> there's trust and there's faith, but again, it isn't baseless. God has shown himself to be good in Jesus. God himself in Jesus had his body ravaged to the point of death on a Roman cross when we were his enemies, when we were rebels against him for our forgiveness, for our redemption and our restoration. So we know God is for us. God is for humanity. So however he arranges things, it is for his glory and for our thriving and our flourishing. The last thing I'll say about faith, the amazing thing about faith, at least in Christianity, is that if you lean into it, everything becomes more certain. As you lean into the uncertain, everything becomes more certain. There, there's a, a certainty, a surety, a confidence that the Holy Spirit gives us, gifts us, as we step out in greater and greater faith. So that's the definition of faith. The preacher then goes on in this chapter to encourage the Christians that he's writing to, and by extension us, to live by faith. So if faith is believing that what we hope for is real, that what we can't see is real, then to live by faith is to live in light of what you hope for being real and to live in light of what you can't see being real. It is to live as if there is a God who created everything seen and unseen, who made you in his image. It is to believe in God. It is to live your life as if God is real and that that God is the triune God revealed in Jesus Christ, that Jesus has done everything necessary to make you right with God, that God loves and accepts you because of Jesus, that you are forgiven, that God is at work in you to make you more like Jesus, that there is a spiritual war happening on behi happening uh, behind the curtain, behind the scenes, that there is a heaven and hell, that salvation is in Jesus, Jesus alone, that Jesus is Lord, that his words are truth, that Jesus will someday come back to judge the world and usher in the new heaven and new earth. To live by faith is to live believing that these things that we hope for and these things that are not seen, that they are real. To live by faith is to have your life shaped accordingly by and around these beliefs. Is this in any way, shape, or form connected to anything else that the preacher has said in Hebrews? Or is this just kind of a random chapter about faith plunked into the last third of this letter? No, I believe it is deeply connected to what has come before and to what comes after. Remember last week what we looked at at the end of chapter 10, or if you don't remember because you didn't see it go back and watch it at the end of chapter 10 the preacher says this we are not those who draw back and are destroyed but those who have faith and obtain life he says I, I, I want us to be I'm confident that we are real true genuine believers in Jesus Christ that we will not withdraw from Jesus back away from Jesus and have our lives ruined and destroyed but rather we will lean into Jesus we will keep worshiping following obeying, loving Jesus, and as a result, we will enter into all that Jesus has for us. We will enter into all that he has promised to us. He says, I am confident, and I pray, and I hope that these are the kinds of Christians that we are, and that's the kind of Christians that I want us to be. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. We keep clinging to Jesus, and we enter into all that Jesus has for us. That connects directly to this chapter because if we are going to keep clinging to Jesus if we are going to keep worshiping and loving and obeying and following and trusting in Jesus we have to have faith we have to have faith we have to believe that what we hope for 
is real. We have to believe that what we can't see is real, and we have to live by that faith, especially when it seems from what we see happening around us that none of these things are true, when we feel for whatever reason that these things are not true. Those are the moments especially when we have to have faith. As I watch the church in North America just endure blow after blow, the moral failings of leaders, the divisiveness, the polarization, the fragmentation, the politi- politicalization of everything in the church, as I just watch churches dividing and fighting and Christians turning on each other, and as I, I, as I see leaders failing and ministries failing, I am sometimes tempted to believe that maybe none of this is real. Jesus says, I will build my church and hell won't overcome it. And I look at what's happening and I say, really? Really, Jesus? You're going to build your church and hell is not going to overcome it because it looks at times like hell is winning. Those are the moments where we really, truly need faith. When we have to lean in that this promise of Jesus that he'll build and darkness and hell and destruction don't overcome, they don't win, the church doesn't die. We have to lean in and believe that when it looks like the church is falling apart. We need faith to live for Jesus, to keep clinging to Jesus, to make it, to enter into all that he has for us. The preacher says this in verse 6 of chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith we cannot live for God. Without faith, we will give up. Like I just said, I have struggled at times to believe that promise of Jesus that he'll keep building the church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. If, if I don't have faith, I won't be able to keep following Jesus, keep trusting Jesus. I'll, I'll give in to my doubts and I'll abandon ministry and the church. Without faith, we'll give up. Without faith, all we have is our our circumstances and people's opinions to reaffirm and reassure us. We will give up if that's the case. We need faith to keep clinging to Jesus to make it. And the preacher goes on in this amazing chapter to inspire us by taking us through a great hall of heroes. Ordinary men and women that did extraordinary things for God by faith. He says, by faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, they did by faith. They did the following amazing things, and he tells us what they did. He says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And then he says this in verse 32, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength after being weak, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead. They were raised to life again. Some men were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection, and others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonments they were stoned they were sawed in two they died by the sword they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins destitute afflicted and mistreated the world was not worthy of them they wandered in deserts and on mountains hiding in caves and holes in the ground all these were approved through their faith but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Incredible verses. Incredible for a lot of reasons. But here's one reason they're incredible. We can sometimes believe that if we live by faith, we will be rewarded in this life with good things. If we live by faith, we will be rewarded in this life with good things, meaning by good things we often mean earthly things that we want. 
We will be blessed with health, wealth, success, influence, power, comfort, popularity. We believe that if we live by faith, If we sacrifice, endure hardship for a time, it will reap dividends. We'll get far more back than what we put in. We'll gain far more than what we sacrificed in this life, in earthly things. And there are systems of theology that have codified this belief that a lot of us have. There is a false gospel circulating called the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel, the word of faith movement. There is a false gospel circulating that God wants you physically healthy and materially wealthy, right? The belief is that Christians should be the richest people on earth and Christians should never get or stay sick. And the key to being rich, the key to being healthy or to being healed if you are sick is faith. The greater the faith you have in God, the more likely he will come through and bless you materially, come through and heal you, come through and protect you from viruses like COVID-19 so that you don't need a mask or a vaccine or precautions of any kind. Jesus has won wealth and prosperity and full healing from all of your diseases for you. You just have to believe. The wealth that you hope for is real, just believe. The health that you hope for is real, just believe. In the Word of Faith movement, they actually believe that you can speak your prosperity and your health into existence, that your faith-filled speech can create these things. This system of theology, this errant false gospel is very modern and it's very North American, but it is spreading throughout the world tragically in places that are deeply, deeply impoverished and desperate. Now that's a very extreme version and many of us can say that we reject that, but I think a lot of us, whether we would like to admit it or not, we have a kind of subtle health and wealth prosperity theology at work in our hearts at all times. If I do this for you, God, what will you do for me? Or if something bad happens to us, God, look at all I've done for you. Why would you allow this to happen to me? I obeyed you so that I would live well, not so that this would happen. We might not want to admit it with our words, but for many Christians, our obedience is conditional. And there is an unspoken expectation of earthly reward, be it a spouse, children, a promotion, the dream house, something. Now, don't hear me saying that God never gives us good things In this life, God is very, very kind. And he does at times give us the desires of our heart. We have a giant maple tree in our backyard. Diana, all of her life, has wanted in the house that she bought to have a giant tree in the backyard. And God gave that to us. God gifted that to us. He gave us a house where we can have a tree like that. And we love that tree. We've built a fort around that tree. We hang swinging hammock chairs from that tree. We love that tree. God is kind and he does at times give us the desires of our heart, but not always. This subtle prosperity, health and wealth gospel, a reduced version perhaps, but it works in our hearts at all times, whether we would like to admit it or not. If I live by faith, my life should look like this. And I love the Bible. I love how honest it is. The preacher is clear here. There were people who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength after being weak, became mighty in battle, put foreign armies to flight, and saw their dead raised back to life again. But there were people who by faith experienced mockings and scourgings. 
as well as bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Both groups, the preacher says, lived faithfully. There was not a group that lived by faith and therefore saw nothing but victory and success. And then a group that had a weaker faith and so experienced mockings and scourgings and marginalization. No, both groups lived faithfully and their experiences were incredibly different. For some of them, they experienced both of these things in their lifetime. Mountaintop victories and valley defeats. Some conquered kingdoms. Some were persecuted and killed. All lived by faith. Living by faith is not, hear me, this is from God truth. Living by faith is not a guarantee of a life where everything is as you want it and as we think it should be. Living by faith can mean incredible hardship, suffering, and difficulty. And for some reason that surprises us here in North America. It really shouldn't surprise us. We follow a God-man who was crucified. We follow a God-man who was titled a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And Jesus said that what he went through, while we would go through it differently, we would go through what he went through. He was very honest and upfront about that, right? He turned to his disciples in Mark 10, 39 and said, the cup I drink you will drink it too. In John 15, 20, he said to them, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. In John 16, 33, you will have suffering in this world, in this life, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. A different world is coming. Living by faith can mean incredible hardship, suffering, and difficulty. But here's the thing. Suffering and difficulty is when our faith is tested. The fire is when our faith is tested as to whether it is gold or hay, real or imagined. We will see in times of testing whether we are the spiritual giants we think we are, or the weaklings we actually are. Now, a lot of you will hear in that condemnation, and it is not condemnation. It is not condemnation. The fire revealing whether our faith is gold or hay, that is God's grace. It is God humbling us. It is God showing us you're not who you think you are and you're not as far along on your journey as you think you are. But God shows us that so that he can do a work in us, so that he can increase our faith, so that he can help us become more who we want to be, so that he can help us move further along on our journey, we would stay where we are and be deluded if God did not show us these things. It is God's grace to show us these things. And remember, remember what we talked about when we talked about Moses in Hebrews chapter 4. We're not saved by having an amazing, incredible faith. We will have moments of faithlessness. We will never have flawless faith in this life. Jesus' faithfulness covers our faithless moments. There's forgiveness and grace for our faithlessness. Jesus doesn't just forgive us. He's also able to increase our faith. It's God's grace to show us when we're not gold, but we're actually hay. Our faith isn't real, it's imagined. It isn't strong, it's weak. This has been a year that has challenged our faith. 
And some of us have proven to be gold. And some of us have not. We've realized, many of us over the last year and a half, that our faith is pretty weak. Our faith is pretty weak. My prayer is that that realization would not turn to a demonic shame that just perpetuates faithlessness, but that that realization would turn to Holy Spirit conviction and life change. Holy Spirit conviction and life change. Jesus, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm not as far along as I thought I was. Forgive me for that. And Jesus, please increase my faith. Help me to be like the people who by faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice and escaped the mouths of lions and escaped the fire. Help me to be like the people who by faith experienced healings and miracles. Help me also to be like the people who by faith experienced mockings and scourgings, who were marginalized, who were persecuted, who were killed. Increase my faith and help me to become like someone who has faith no matter what their circumstances are. Come what may. I want to be a person who whatever happens will still believe and will live in light of what I believe. And the preacher ends like this. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. These heroes from the Old Testament, they did not live to see the Messiah come, to see Jesus come. They did not live to see the old covenant supplanted and the new covenant inaugurated with its better promises of full forgiveness for all sins for forever, the promise of heart change, the promise of full, unhindered access to the presence of God, a vibrant, intimate relationship with God as Father for all who believe. They didn't live to see the Messiah come, and that new covenant with its better promises inaugurated. They didn't live to see that. Theirs was a forward-looking faith, and the preacher says they didn't obtain what was promised. He says, but now the new covenant has come, and they are being made perfect with us. They have now entered into heaven, and someday when Jesus returns, we will all be glorified, perfected together, and we will live with God forever in the new heavens and new earth. They had faith that that day would come. We have faith that that day will come. And we will be perfected together. The preacher is essentially ending this chapter with a reassurance that it will all be worth it. It will all be worth it. All the pain, all the loss, all the difficulty, all the challenges, all the suffering, it will all be worth it. All the sacrifices will be worth it. Not because we will receive earthly rewards in this life, but because we will enter into even greater rewards and greater promises in the life to come. The preacher says, just as the faith of the Old Testament saints was rewarded, your faith will be rewarded. Someday, the unseen will be seen. Someday, what is hoped for will become reality. Someday, we will see Jesus. Someday we will see Jesus. And there won't be need for faith anymore. Nothing will be held back. It will all be revealed. And we will be able in that moment and in all of those eternal moments, we will be able to say with Paul that all of the losses and sufferings of this life, they are but a momentary light affliction compared to the absolutely incomparable eternal weight of the glory of Jesus. Paul also says this 
in that verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, he says, so, as a result of that, do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We cannot make it for Jesus if we don't have faith. We need to have faith, and we need every day to live by faith. But faith will not be the way we exist for forever. Someday what is unseen will be seen. What is hoped for will become reality. And we will see that it has been entirely worth it to live by faith, to keep clinging to Jesus and following Jesus. We all have faithlessness. And I would invite you now to repent of that faithlessness. Jesus' faithfulness covers your faithlessness. But I want us also to pray that Jesus would increase our faith. Jesus' disciples asked him, increase our faith. We can do the same. Jesus, increase our faith that we would be like the people in Hebrews 11 who lived by faith even when it was hard. They kept believing even when it was falling apart all around them. And now they've entered into their reward. Help us to be like them. By your power and grace, Jesus, increase our faith. Forgive us for our faithlessness and increase our faith that we would live for you courageously, unashamedly in this world come what may. Amen. Thank you again so much for being here today. I really hope that this message encouraged and helped you, built you up, challenged you, stretched you, whatever it is you needed. I pray that it happened in your life or that it happens as a result of today. Thanks for being here. If you're new, uh, feel free to go to southeastcitychurch.ca. Uh, you can learn more about our church there. You can connect with us through the website. You can explore the claims and teachings of Jesus and what they mean for your life. So please don't just walk away from this message and, and forget about Southeast City Church. Please go to our website and, and check us out and reach out to us and connect with us. Someone will reach back out to you. You can also enter prayer requests on our website, which I would encourage you to do. If you're a visitor guest, feel free to enter prayer requests. If you're a member of our church, feel free to enter prayer requests there as well, and you will be prayed for. Um, yeah, I just, I really hope <laughs> that we can connect after this, that this isn't I just watched that and now I'm done, uh, but that we would be able to have an ongoing conversation as a result of what has happened here today. So thanks again for being with us. Love you all. Praying for you all. Hope you have a great week, and we'll see you back here uh, next week, or maybe we'll see you in person for Church in the Garden. We'll be looking at the first 13 verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, God bless, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>